Hello and welcome to Bay College's online lectures for college algebra. In this video, we're going to look at section 1.3, quadratic equations in the complex number system. Uh, if we look at this first example, if we had an equation like this, which is quadratic, maybe we'd want to say, OK, well, let's see if we can factor it. Well, the sum of squares does not factor, only the difference of squares. So this isn't going to work for factoring. Well, let's try another method. What about the square root method? Well, I can isolate this perfect squared term, subtract 4 from both sides, and I get negative 4 equals x squared. Well, now I can take the square root of both sides, and when I do that, plus or minus the square root of negative 4 equals x. Now, if we think about what a square root is, it says what number times itself is the value under the radical. Well, is there a value times itself that will ever give us a negative? A negative times a negative is a positive, and a positive times a positive is a positive. So there is no value that will give us negative 4. So there's no real solution to this. And because of this, we have to come up with a new number system. And it's called the complex number system. Let's uh, move over here to look at the complex number system here. Complex numbers are always written in the form a plus bi, where this unit of i is the basis of the complex number system. We'll define it a little uh, more shortly. But it has a real part and then an imaginary part. And that's what that i is all about. Well, if we just assess this, a and b are real numbers. Well, if b is 0, well, 0 times anything is 0. And a plus 0 is just a, so we get the value a. a is the real part. This would be a real number. This is the number system that we understand, where we find on a number line. If b is not 0, we have our complex number a plus bi. So let's assess the a part, the real part. If a is 0, we, we would just have bi. 0 plus bi would just be bi. This is a pure imaginary number because it only has an imaginary part. So it's a pure imaginary number. If a is something other than 0, we have the complex number a plus bi, a real part and an imaginary part. It has both parts. That is our imaginary number, which we defined up there. So all the way down, if, if neither are 0, it's always written in the form a plus bi. Let's look at this example. 4, well, if we think of this, it's in our real number system, but it's also in the complex number system. Oh, the only difference is we have 0 for our b. 0 times anything is just 4. That's our real number. 2i, well, that means that a is 0. So this is a pure imaginary number, because it's purely imaginary. No real part to it at all. This here, 2 minus 7i, it has a real part and an imaginary part. So a and b are both not 0. a plus bi is the form. This is our imaginary number. Now let's define this i. Why do we call it the imaginary unit? Well, we know that there's no such thing as a square root of a negative number in the real number system. So we define it as the square root of negative 1. What's nice about negative 1 is we can always factor out negative 1. 1 is a factor of every number. And by factoring out a negative, we just change its sign. So we can then deal with it. Well, let's look at some of the properties of i. What happens if I have multiples of i? If I have uh, i squared, well, that's nothing more than negative, the square root of negative 1 times the square root of negative 1. Well, when we square a square root, they essentially cancel out. The square root of negative 1 squared is negative 1. The radical goes away. What if I have i cubed? Well, the square root of negative 1 times the square root of negative 1 times the square root of negative 1. I have three of them multiplied together. Well, if we know that this is true, it, when you square a square root, it goes away. This is negative 1. Negative 1 times this value, this is the definition of i. So it's negative i. So i cubed is negative i. i to the fourth, and now it's getting a little tedious because we're writing it out over and over and over. Well, every pair is negative 1, just like we saw this, i squared. So this is i squared, which is negative 1 
times, this is i squared, negative 1. Negative 1 times negative 1 is positive 1. So i to the fourth is positive 1. Now, like I said, it's getting tedious. I don't want to write this five times. If we see the pattern here, each uh, value of i is just one more times i. So it'd be i to the fourth times one more i. So that would be 1 times i is just i. i to the sixth would be i times i, which is i squared. And we already know i squared is negative 1. And i to the seventh is the same as i cubed. i to the eighth is i fourth. i to the ninth is i fifth. So we see that pattern. So here is all we really have to memorize, i through i to the fourth. But I'm going to star i to the second and i to the fourth, because these are our keys to using this, at least for me it is. If I have i to any power, if it's divisible by 4, it's equal to positive 1. If it's not divisible by 4, but it's divisible by 2, then it's equal to negative 1. I can also use that concept even if i is an odd number. Let's look at this next example here. If I have i to the 41st power, well, let's break this down. i to the 40th times i. We're just using our rules of exponents. This would be our product rule if this was our base x, let's just say x. If they're the same base, we'd just add their powers. 40 and 1 is 41. So I didn't really change its value. I just changed the way it looks. This is divisible by 4. So this is equal to 1. 1 times i is just i. And that will work in every instance. So if I can break this down to the closest even number by just pulling out an i, then I can use that rule. If it's divisible by 4, it's equal to 1. If it's divisible by 2 and not 4, then it's negative 1. So in that case, I might get a negative i. Let's look at this. Now, before I said we can always factor out a negative 1. Well, that's what we want to do here. The square root of negative 9 would be the square root of 9 times the square root of negative 1, our definition of i. And if we simplify that, well, the square root of 9 is 3. And the square root of negative 1 is i, by definition, 3i. We have a pure imaginary number. Our a value is 0 here. What about this here? Well, let's do the same thing. I have negative the square root of 25 times the square root of negative 1. I'm just factoring out a negative 1 to get our definition of i. Well, negative square root of 25, square root of 25 is 5. Negative 5 times i. Another imaginary number, but this negative was outside. It changed the sign. So that's how we work with radicals. We can always pull out that i if we see a negative. We can just take a shortcut and say, oh, well, that's i. So we can go straight to there. When it comes to adding or subtracting imaginary numbers or complex numbers, we can, the rules of math never change. So essentially, we just have to follow our rules. Think of this as a binomial, a plus bi minus some a plus bi. When we have that negative, we can think of it as just distributing. So negative 8, positive i if I distribute it. So combine like terms. 6 and a negative 8 is negative 2. 5i minus a negative i is 5i plus i, which would give me 6i's. And it's written in a plus bi form. This is the proper form that we have to write our complex numbers. The real part plus the, or minus the imaginary part. So that's addition or subtraction. Same rules, nothing changes. What if we're multiplying? Well, if I have the square root of negative 2 times the square root of negative 7, we can't just combine them and say, oh, it's the square root of 14, because a negative times a negative is positive. That doesn't work in the imaginary number system. We have to pull out that i, pull out that square root of negative 1. So I'm just going to pull it out, call it i times the square root of 2 times i square root of 7. Pull out that negative, call it i. Now, if we look at this, now I can combine it. i times i is i squared times the square root of 2 times the square root of 7. Now I can put them together to get the square root of 14. Oh. And what do we know about i squared? Well, i squared is negative 1. So a negative 1 times that is negative 
square root of 14, which is a real value. All right, <clears throat> let's look at some more examples of multiplication. Here we have a pure imaginary number times another imaginary number in A plus BI form. I use my rules of multiplication. I'm just going to use the distributive property. 6i times 2 is 12i. 6i times negative 3 is negative 18i times i is i squared. Now, what do we know about i squared? It's just negative 1, so that changes the sign. Plus 18. Negative 1 times negative 18 is positive 18. But I'm not done yet because I need to write this in proper form. The real part and the imaginary part, 18 plus 12i, a plus bi form. What about this here? Now we have i's of other powers. I could distribute it just like I did there, but let's simplify these i's first. i to the fourth, well, this is divisible by 4 because it is 4, is equal to 1. 1 times 2 is just 2. i squared is negative 1. 1 plus a negative 1. Well, 1 plus negative 1 is 1 minus 1, which is 0. 2 times 0 is 0. So just by simplifying it, we didn't have to use that distributive property in this case because we ended up with some real value. 0 is a real value. It is in the real number system. All right, another tool that we can use is called complex conjugates. And some of the notation you might see in the textbook is z is our just our notation for a complex number, a plus bi. It's conjugate, that's what this bar over the z means. The conjugate of this number is a minus bi. The only difference is the sign changes between them. These are complex conjugates. If we multiply complex conjugates, we're actually going to end up with a real value. And we'll look at this and see why. What happens? Uh, if we just observe this for a moment, it looks like the difference of squares. Well, a times a, if we use FOIL, we get a squared. Uh, a times bi is abi. a times negative bi is negative abi. The middle terms cancel out, just like they would if we were uh, uh, multiplying the sum or difference of squares. And bi times negative bi is a negative bi squared. What is i squared? It's negative 1. Negative times a negative is a positive. I forgot my squared term there, though. And we notice we get the sum of squares. Now, there is no way to factor that unless we factor in the complex number system. So a conjugate, just changing the sign in between it, is a tool we can use to get a real value if we need to. Now, here's an example. If I have a complex number, of 3 minus 4i, its conjugate, that's just the bar over the top, tells me the conjugate is 3 plus 4i. Just change the signs in between them. So the reason why we introduce this is because we use this to explain division in the complex number system. If you recall from a previous math class, you had to uh, rationalize your denominators. So if we move over here, let's look at division. This i is a square root. And we don't want square roots in our denominators, so we're going to rationalize the denominator. And in order to rationalize the denominator, how do we get this i term to go away? That's where we use the tool of a complex conjugate. The complex conjugate here would be a minus bi. I just changed the sign between them. And now I can FOIL this out. And when I do, I get a squared plus b squared. These are real values. So whatever's in my denominator is a real value with no uh, radical. But what I do to the bottom, I have to do to the top, because essentially I'm just multiplying by 1. And then I can use the distributive property of the multiplication rules I used, a times c minus b, or, or yeah, b, c, i. So I've rationalized it. It's still an imaginary number. Maybe if I knew what these values were, I could split it up to a plus bi form, where I have the real part separated from the imaginary part. And I could do that. It'd be ac over this quantity minus bci over this quantity. And just for time's sake, so I'll leave that. 
So I want to rationalize this. I want to do this division of complex numbers. And I do that by rationalizing the denominator with its complex conjugate. What is the conjugate? 2 minus 3i. And what I do to the bottom, I do to the top. Now I can just use FOIL. And I'm going to use a little shortcut here. If I FOIL the bottom, I'm going to get the first term squared minus the second term squared, because the middle terms cancel out because they're different signs. Well, I get 4 minus 9i squared. Well, that i squared is negative 1. That's just going to change the sign here. Let's change that sign right now. And if you missed that, pause the video, back it up. 4 plus 9 is 13. And then I can use FOIL at the top here. So I'm going to get 4. I'm going to get minus 6i, minus 6i again, minus 12i. And negative 3i times negative 3i is a positive 9i squared. And if we do a little simplification, that i squared just changes the sign. 4 minus 9 is 5, right? Oh, negative 5. Don't make a sign error. Minus 12i. Now, let's pause for a moment and say, is this in a plus bi form? No, it's not. It has to be the real part, which is negative 5 over 13 minus the imaginary part, 12 thirteenths is my b, times i. So we split it up. Now it's an a plus bi form. And it has to be written in that form. All right, let's look at this example here. We have i to the negative 23rd. We're going to take the long route in how to solve this. And then we're going to take the easy route. i to the negative 23rd, well, how do we get rid of a negative exponent? We take its reciprocal. And now that we've taken its reciprocal, maybe we can simplify this. Well, is this, which version of i is it? Well, I'm going to say, OK, it's i to the 22nd times i. That's the same as i to the 23rd. This is not divisible by 4, but it is divisible by 2. So it's negative i. So we did a little bit of simplifying. Now, to rationalize that, because this is a square root, I'm going to multiply by its conjugate its complex conjugate, I just change the sign. A is 0, B is negative 1. Change the sign of B, so I get positive i. What I do to the bottom, I do to the top. So a negative i times i would be a negative i squared, which is positive 1, because we've got to change the sign, right? And 1 times i is i. So i, negative i, right? There it is. That's it. Not so bad, right? All right, well, let's, I told you there's a shortcut to this. And uh, I'm going to erase this for a moment. And I'm going to use the shortcut. If I subtract 1 from this, I get negative 24 times i. So I made it even by taking 1 away. Is this divisible by 4? Yes, it is. So this would just be 1. The reciprocal of 1 is still 1. So this is 1 times i equals i. So there we have it, kind of a shortcut method. Use your values of 2 and 4 to say, is it a positive value or a negative value? And we can work it out. All right, let's uh, move over here. If you recall in the last uh, lecture video, we talked about the discriminant, how the discriminant tells us if we have imaginary real or one real with multiplicity. If the discriminant is less than 0, that means what's under that radical of our quadratic formula is negative. That's where we get these two imaginary numbers. If it's positive, we get two real numbers. And if it's equal to 0, we get one real with multiplicity 2. Now that we have uh, some understanding, and hopefully we'll practice and do some homework so that we have a deeper understanding, of the imaginary number system, now we can solve any quadratic equation regardless if it's real or imaginary. And we can use that discriminant. If we're asked to find a solution in the complex number system, we can look at this and say, hey, are, am I looking for values that contain i, or am I looking for real values? Let's take a look at this and use all of our knowledge of uh, 
solving quadratics or things that are quadratic in form. This here, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to uh, set this equal to 0. I get x to the fourth minus 1 equals 0. And now I'm going to factor it, because factoring is a useful tool. This is a perfect square, and so is 1. So I'm just going to say the difference of squares, factor it in that form. So I get x squared minus 1, x squared plus 1 equals to 0. And then I realize, hey, I can factor it a little further. x minus 1, x plus 1 times this value here, which I can't factor in the real number system. So I'm just going to leave it like that, because we're going to review our rules of solving quadratics. Here we can use the zero factor theorem. x equals, for this factor to be 0, positive 1. And for this factor to be 0, negative 1. But what about this? Let's use our rules for solving quadratics. What would make this value equal to 0? Well, I can subtract 1 from both sides. And now I can use that square root property we talked about in the previous video. x equals plus or minus the square root of negative 1. And that, in itself, is the definition of i. So plus or minus i. I found four solutions, positive 1, negative 1, positive i, negative i. And this is the key. At most, I should have found four solutions, which I did. And I could have used the discriminant uh, when I got to this point right here. I, and here, I could say, hey, this one has two real solutions, because the discriminant would be positive. This one would have two negative or, or imaginary solutions, because the discriminant is just that negative. So using uh, your properties for solving quadratics, I have a quiz for you. And that quiz is this right here. Solve this quadratic in the complex number system. You can use any method you want. But if you look at this, if you look at the discriminant, b squared is 16 minus 4ac. 4 times 8 times 1 is 32. 16 minus 32 is negative 16. So you know that's going to be in the complex number system just by using the discriminant. So your quiz will be to solve that right there. x squared plus 4x plus 8 equals 0. This has been section 1.3, quadratic equations in the complex number system. Thank you for watching.